Good morning, church. Welcome to worship once again. We're so glad you're joining us and tuning in on this Memorial Day weekend. I hope that uh, if you may be traveling, we, we pray God's blessing on you wherever you might be. But this morning as we gather, we come as believers, fellowshipping together, seeking a blessing from God. I pray that God right now in a powerful way, wherever you are, would minister his Holy Spirit to you as we worship together and as we study God's Word. Good morning, everyone. Please bow your heads with me as we pray. Our most gracious, kind Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for just your love and your grace. We thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you, Lord, for just your love for us. Lord, as we begin to worship, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come down and to fill our hearts and our minds 
so that we will be ready, Lord, for the message that you have prepared for us today. Lord, for us, as we come to you, Lord, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. Lord, I know that sometime during this week we have displeased you. And so, Lord, we ask humbly that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and that you would give us Christ's righteousness, Lord. Lord, we cannot live this life on our own. We're always going to make mistakes. And so, Lord, fill us, please, with your spirit so that we can be victorious just like you. Lord, I pray, Lord, for the sermon today. Lord, that you will anoint your speaker. Lord, that you will fill him with the Holy Spirit, Lord. And that we will hear you speaking through him to us today. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds. Lord, we just like to praise you, Lord, for um, the opening of this country. Lord, with the amount of coronavirus patients, Lord, that are being less and less. Lord, we just like to thank you for that. And Lord, because of this, Lord, I know that you have put into our hearts, Lord, to be uh, more vigilant in sharing your gospel, sharing your word to those around us, to our community, Lord. So, Lord, give us the opportunity. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit and guide us that we may reach more souls for you so that more souls will get to go to heaven someday. Lord, be with us today on this Sabbath, Lord. May we feel your presence. May we bask in your glory. Thank you for all you do for us. We love you and we thank you. And Lord, for those who are, that cannot join us today, we ask for your special blessing and your special presence to be with them. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Over the past six weeks, in our series on forgiveness and also during parts one and two of our current series, we've sought to address the question, what went wrong in God's universe? We've clearly established that God's timeless plan in all the universe and in the earth extends far beyond our own personal salvation. There's this much larger view that involves the entire cosmos, this cosmic conflict between good and evil, between God and Satan. The God story from Genesis to Revelation is, in fact, God's transparent demonstration providing evidence as to who is telling the truth, God or Satan. We've also discovered in our study together that God is not the kind of person his enemies have made him out to be, arbitrary, restrictive, untrustworthy, self-serving. We've also seen that the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are working equally together to fulfill their eternal purposes. Today's message is new beginnings. And as we study the Word of God today, we're going to uh, understand that, as we mentioned last week, the spiritual terrain of our world is, is rapidly changing. We live in a time of convergence, and unlike any previous generation, the opportunity to see the big picture from God's perspective is available to us like no other generation. This larger cosmic view will be the lens that we will now look through as we seek to understand the story of God and his loving intervention for the purpose of redeeming and restoring humankind back to himself. As we've looked at God's intervention, today we're going to focus primarily on the left side of our timeline, from creation to the flood. The biblical story opens presenting God as creator of all things, including the first human beings. From Adam and Eve, all other human beings would come forth. And so God sets an immediate pattern, that of creation and then procreation. Notice Genesis 1. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Then in Genesis 4, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. 
Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3 takes it a step further with the son Seth. When Adam was 130 years old, he became the father of a son who was just like him in his very image. And he named his son Seth. So we see this pattern of creation and procreation. And here in Genesis 5, we, we have the listing of the descendants of Adam. Now, what's interesting here is that Adam in the Bible is referred to as the first son of God. We get this from Luke's genealogy of Jesus. Uh, and in Luke, where the genealogy of Jesus uh, leading up to the Messiah, each person is called the son of some human father until you get all the way back to Adam, who is distinguished from all the others like this. Notice, when uh, Kenan was the son of Enosh, Enosh was the son of Seth, Seth was the son of Adam, Adam was the son of God. Adam is a son of God in a more foundational sense than any other human beings that would follow him. Why? Well, he was the first of his kind. He was the first human from whom all other human beings would emerge and receive their identity. So Adam and Eve cre were created by God. Everyone else was procreated. Adam was head of the human race from whom all humanity would receive their likeness. And beginning with him, the image of God would be passed on generation to generation, thus creating an ever-widening circle of human beings that had the capacity to love as God loves, to, to live in God's image and his likeness. That was the divine plan in, human, in humanity's creation. In other words, there was to be a succession of sons and daughters who would pass on God's image. What a wonderful plan, right? But here, the story makes a tragic shift. And interruption is imposed on God's plan. And this interruption we call the fall of humanity into sin. As we've previously discussed, this fallen angel Lucifer deceived humanity into believing lies about God, that he was arbitrary, restrictive, untrustworthy, and self-serving. And this intervention, uh, or this interruption, nearly effaced the image of God from the Son of God, thus disrupting the capacity of God's son, Adam, to transmit God's image from generation to generation. And because of this unfortunate interruption in God's plan, intervention was needed. An intervention that would have to happen from the inside of the human situation. An intervention that would offer a new way forward with a new starting point, a new beginning. An intervention that would come in the form of a new son of God to replace Adam. An intervention that would provide a new head of the human race who would reestablish God's image in humanity. When Adam and Eve sinned, as we read in Genesis 3, the Creator actually prophesied in the form of a threat to Satan, but in the form of a promise to humanity. And the promise of deliverance in God's promise to humanity was set forth in the language of progeny or offspring. Notice Genesis 3 verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So let's examine that a little closer here. And I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, Eve, and between your offspring and hers, her progeny. Then he, the coming offspring, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. In other words, God is laying out that there will be two groups of people. That throughout human history, they're going to be at odds with one another. There would be a spiritual lineage 
that would come forth from Satan. And, and this lineage would, would wage war against God and against God's people. But then there'd be a spiritual lineage that would come forth from the woman through which the special offspring would be born. And this Messiah would conquer Satan and reverse the fall of Adam. The second Adam, Christ, a new son of God that would succeed where the first Adam failed. From the outset, the God story reveals that God is addressing the sin problem in terms of family succession, promising the eventual birth of a child. And, and what a beautiful picture of God, right? The God who created humanity intends to save humanity from the inside, from within our very own genetic realm. Wow! How beautiful of God. And from this strange, uh, or from this strategic position, a son of God will be born with Adam's lineage in order to redeem Adam's fall. And so as we see in this God story from creation and eventually the new creation when God restores all things, we have these three major interventions of God, the flood, the cross, and the second coming. And we want to look at this part of the story here from creation to the flood. So even now, we, we, we're beginning to see God's plan revealed. We see these two lines of, of descendants emerging, the descendants of Adam and the descendants of Cain. Now notice the faith of Abel, Enoch, and Noah listed in the great faith chapter of Hebrews 11. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man. And God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. Notice this. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without what? Without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Now to Noah. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about the things that had never happened. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by God faith. Hebrews 11 begins by listing these, these great examples of faith, this, this line of descendants coming forth from Adam. And here in Hebrews 11, this is contrasted with the descendants of Cain as we read about the condition of the world in Genesis 6. Notice verses 5 through 7. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. Now I want to pause there for just a moment. Sometimes... Even Christians will view the great interventions of God from the standpoint that God is, is angry. Now, the Bible does talk about God's wrath. But when properly understood in the whole of the God story, we see the consistency of who God is. And, and by his nature, he's not this vengeful, uh, angry God. It says right here, the condition of the earth, it broke his heart. 
And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. So here God is in this God story. He creates a perfect Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and, and their sons. And there's this interruption in God's plan. And as a result, there was this ongoing decline. Unfortunately, due to humans' a rapid uh, move into sin and their decline, it was necessary for God to actually intervene in a major way. To facilitate enough time so that the God story could unfold through the coming of the Messiah. Now, what an extreme intervention by God. Talk about taking the risk of being misunderstood. I mean, this was huge. So why would God set such a dramatic precedent? Now, he had already drawn boundaries with Lucifer and his angels in heaven. He had already set boundaries with Adam and Eve in the garden. And now he was about to set another boundary in a major and significant way. You see, when it comes to Cain's offspring, when it pertains to earthly knowledge and, and material progress, these were brilliant, brilliant people. And they became distinguished for all that they could do. Now, the problem was that they had no regard for God. Uh, they had no regard for God's purposes in humanity. And as a result, sin quickly spread throughout the earth. But, but think about this. Consider the fact that Adam lived nearly a thousand years, 930 to be specific, but nearly a thousand years, he witnessed the results of sin. In fact, to his children's children, to the ninth generation, he described the truth about God. He would tell his offspring, his merciful, God's merciful provisions for their salvation. And yet few would listen. And Adam often met with bitter reproaches for his sin that brought suffering on his posterity. The antediluvian world was, was not an era of ignorance and barbarism. People, uh, people possessed great physical and mental strength. I mean, consider today. Men and women apply themselves in study and accomplishment for 20 to 50 years. And the world is filled with admiration about their attainments. But how limited must be these accomplishments in comparison to those who continued developing their knowledge and skills over centuries? Without books, no written records, they had great retention. And they would share uh, up to seven generations that were living together at the same time. I mean, the advantages that they enjoyed, they had the opportunity to gain a knowledge of God that was unequaled. And, and this time was not an era of spiritual darkness. Rather, it was of great light. The world at that time had the opportunity to receive instruction directly from Adam and the angels. The world at that time had a silent witness in the presence of the Garden of Eden as it remained on earth for centuries with the cherubim posted at the gate keeping guard. This was the very place that Cain and Abel had brought their sacrifices. This was the very place that God condescended to communicate with them. See, skepticism could not deny the existence of the Garden of Eden while it stood right there directly in, in everyone's sight. The order of creation, the object of the garden, the history of the two trees so closely connected with humanity's destiny, these were undisputed facts. In essence, the existence and the sovereignty of God was still visible. And while Cain's descendants built cities and pursued evil, only a few prominent true worshipers of God in the line of Adam are mentioned in Scripture. Abel, Seth, Enoch, and Noah. Now, 
When it comes to the flood, we often focus only on Noah and the 120 years that God brought warning to humanity of his coming intervention with the flood. However, I think it's important for us to recognize that multiple generations, over centuries of time, God had attempted through a line of godly families to reach the world with the truth about him. And this world was quickly spinning out of control. I mean, in that world before the flood, sin prevailed. These antediluvians enjoyed many rich gifts that God originally created. However, they used these blessings to glorify themselves. In doing so, the blessings became curses. You see, they then focused their affections on the gifts rather than the giver of the gifts. And amid all the prevailing corruption, Methuselah and Noah and many others labored to keep alive the knowledge of the true God. 120 years before the flood, the Lord through a holy angel declared to Noah his purpose and his plan. And God directed him to build an ark, a big boat, for the purpose of saving humanity. Genesis 6 and verse 9. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless, blameless person living on earth at that time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. So God said to Noah in verse 13, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. So, God gives Noah all the specifications to build this large boat. And then Noah, by faith, joins God in God's work and cooperating with God in his eternal plan and purpose. Noah makes a choice to believe God. Now, he makes this choice not based on what his eyes could see, because again, as we just read in Scripture, God had revealed things to him that were coming that had never happened or occurred. So Noah cooperates with God. He makes the choice based on the word that he heard from the Lord. Something was about to happen that had never happened before. And Noah, by his actions, gave evidence of his faith. And Noah invested everything everything that he possessed for the sole purpose of building this ark. Many at first received Noah's warning. However, during the time that elapsed before the coming flood, their faith was tested. I mean, they think about it. They were overcome by all the prevailing unbelief that was around them. There were many people that were uh, ridiculing Noah. And, and soon many of these joined the others in rejecting the solemn message that Noah was bringing. And, and some of these people that at the first had accepted the message, they became the boldest and most defiant scoffers. Many professed worshipers of God at that time. Their minds were so blinded, they really believed that Noah's message was a delusion. The world before the flood reasoned for centuries, that the laws of nature were fixed. Recurring seasons had, had come and gone in their order. Rain had never fallen. You see, at that time, the earth was watered with a mist or a dew. Rivers had never overflowed their boundaries. As time passed and there seemed to be no apparent changes in nature, they reasoned as many reason now through science that nature is above the God of nature. They asserted that if Noah was speaking the truth, then renowned men and wise men, prudent men, would understand the matter. Had antediluvians believed and repented, God in mercy would have changed the course just as he did in Nineveh later. But their obstinate resistance filled up their measure of guilt and iniquity. And the period of God's mercy 
was about to expire. Noah faithfully followed the instructions of the Lord. And now the servant of God makes his final appeal only to again have it be rejected with much scoffing. Suddenly silence fell on the mocking crowd because nature began to speak. At God's direction, the animals came. Genesis 7, verses 5 through 10. So Noah did everything as the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood covered the earth. He went on board the boat to escape the flood, he and his wife and his sons and their wives. With them were all the various kinds of animals, those approved for eating and for sacrifice and those that were not, along with all the birds and the small animals that scurry along the ground. They entered the boat in pairs, male and female, just as God had commanded. After seven days, the waters of the flood came and covered the earth. In the dark history of Cain and Cain's descendants, God provides evidence to the entire cosmos what would have been the result of permitting sinners to live forever in rebellion against God. You see, God's forbearance and his mercy only rendered the wicked to be more bold and defiant in their evil. The condition of the world before the flood illustrated to the entire universe the results of the administration that Lucifer had endeavored to establish in heaven when he rejected the authority of Christ. The history of Cain and his descendants shows what mankind becomes apart from Christ. Humanity has no power to regenerate itself. Humanity does not tend upward toward the divine, but rather downward toward the satanic. Don't we see that in our world today? Christ is the only hope. There is no other name under heaven whereby we can be saved. The God story is God's demonstration, providing evidence for who's telling the truth. Remember when God said, or, or what we talked about last week, when we have been hard of hearing, God has raised his voice? Well, God at the time of the flood was needing to raise his voice. Planet Earth was not listening to the truth from those godly families. And God took a huge risk of being misunderstood. And he intervenes with a great flood. And he destroys the entire world. This extreme emergency measure God in his sovereignty and wisdom knew that it was necessary in order to redeem mankind through the coming Messiah. God in his wisdom and foreknowledge knew that the risk must be taken. I believe this. God carries with him the sympathy and approval of the whole universe as step by step, his great plan advances to its complete fulfillment. That's what the God story is all about. As we begin to think about this, this great intervention at the time of the flood, and as we explore in coming weeks the connection between the flood and Noah and all the parallels that tie into what lies in front of us, the second coming of Christ. May we see the flood, may we understand the flood for what it truly was, a mighty, redemptive 
intervention in love. It was an emergency measure of necessity in reconciling humanity back to God. Let us bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we sing the mighty power. We see your sovereignty and your wisdom as demonstrated in the God story. In love, you've revealed the truth about yourself. And this demonstration of love includes these mighty interventions. And God, eventually, we know that you sent your son, Jesus, to this earth to actually become one of us, taking on our very DNA in order to redeem us back to you. God, in the days in which we live and in, and in the days that, that are coming forward to us, I just pray, God, that you would give us all discernment and wisdom and hearts to understand how this story from long ago is so relevant to life right now in 2021. So God, as we continue our study and as we think about your second coming and as we prepare to be ready for your second coming, May your Holy Spirit reveal these truths in a deep and fresh way to us that like Noah, we could exercise our faith and make a choice to cooperate with you in your eternal purpose and your eternal plan. We pray this and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.